Welcome to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the popes and Christianity. I am your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. You can find show notes, how to contact me, sign up for our mailing list, and how to support the history of the papacy by going to our website, a2zhistorypage.com. Two great ways to support the history of the papacy are leaving your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. And another really great way to support the history of the papacy is by going and joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Your support on Patreon goes a long, long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon. Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits to you for supporting the show on Patreon. You will receive early and advertisement-free content, bonus episodes, monthly book drawings, and most importantly, you will be included on the history of the papacy diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the lists of bishops commemorated in order of their precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you'll be on the lists of the history of the papacy patrons. Today, I would like to send a very special thank you to our latest patron at the Alexandria level, Judy. I would also like to thank DM Franks, who is now a supporter at the Antioch level. Thank you, Judy and DM, so much for your support. I truly appreciate it. Now let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have Roberto, Joran, William B., Brian, Jeffrey, Christina, John, Sarah, William H., Augustus, Keanu, and Judy at the Alexandria level, Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, and Steve, all of whom are magnificent at the Constantinople level, and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the See of Rome, we have Peter the Great, Leonard the Great, Alex the Great, and Amma the Great. With that, I hope you enjoy this next piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. I think a great way to start out today is just a little bit of review and wrap-up from the last episode and the last few episodes. Let's talk a little bit about Gregory the Sixteenth as a first place to start as a quick, quick review. He was a major, major conservative. Some say a reactionary. He wouldn't build railroads in the Papal States. He refused to industrialize. industrialize. He kept tariffs high, and he was against Italian unification. He was, if there was a type of reform, he was generally against it. He advocated for better treatments of the Jews, but it may have been from more of a cynical perspective than necessarily an enlightened one. Well, one way or the other, Gregory, as most people do, Gregory died in his case on June 1st, 1846. You know, in the past 50 years or so had been rocky for the papacy, the papal state, and the Catholic Church. You have the French Revolution. The, the revolutionaries in France and Napoleon took away many powers of the church. They imprisoned two popes and pretty much killed one of them. And this whole time period damaged the political powers of the popes and the papal states. After Napoleon, Europe was a very unsettled place. The papacy was able to come back from near death after the French Revolution and start to claw back on top. So we look at these reoccurring themes. The papal, the secular powers of the papal states, the papacy worked on becoming a major player in European politics again, and they really worked to reestablish centralized religious power over groups that over the past 50, 60, 70 years had advocated for national churches and more local control. 
Then we have this uh, that ties into this idea of ultramontanism or over the mountains, that the power of the church should be focused in Rome. And so we take a look at these two things. We have religious power and political power, the same two themes that will play out in the papacy for the thousand years before this point. This is the story of the papacy. Now we hit a major turning point in church and papal history, and that name attached to that is Giovanni Maria Mastai Ferretti, soon to be Pope Pius IX. In this episode, we're going to talk about Pius IX's early life. I'll call him Pius sometimes, Mastai Ferretti throughout this episode. I really probably should stick to the convention of calling him Mastai Ferretti before he becomes Pope and then Pius IX afterwards. Words, but you know how that goes. We'll talk about Pius's conclave. We'll do a really brief overview of the revolutions of 1848. Uh, and how a soon-to-be international player, the United States, were, is going to fit into all of this. And as we soon will soon see, the massive immigration from Europe to the United States during the middle of the 19th century, especially the so many Catholics that are coming from the German states and the Italian states and other parts of Europe, are really going to affect the the history of and the the politics that were going on in the United States at that time. Pius IX as a pope and even as a a pre-pope, he was a complicated man. And learning about his papacy will help us understand the whole time period much better. There's the continuation of the anti-papal and anti-clerical feelings in Rome and Italy, but there's also a huge support for the church as well. As well, there's these two competing factors, and this is a big part of this whole time period: is competing factors that are always pushing and pulling against each other. And really, my question to you throughout the rest of this series is: Is Pius the Ninth the greatest pope of all time, or the biggest failure? And this doesn't necessarily have to be a binary choice. He can be both. Let's talk a little bit about Pius IX before his papacy. He was born on May 13th, 1792. He died on February 7th, 1878, at 85 years of age. His papacy went from June 16th, 1846, when he was 55, to February 7th, 1878, when he died. He died in office, as most popes do, and and that's one thing. A a papacy of this long, you can see that there was no quit in Pius IX. He was beatified by Pope John Paul II a couple decades ago, but he's not sainted yet, and there's a major controversy even in him being beatified. The uh, Jewish community had some problems with this, uh, liberals in general, liberal Catholics, but he's also highly supported by other groups as well. So you see that Pius IX was a lightning rod back in his day, and he's a lightning rod today as well. Steve here. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network featuring great shows like Scott Rank's History Unplugged podcast and other great podcasts. Go to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more. And here is a quick word from our sponsors. Giovanni Mastai Ferretti was born to a minor aristocratic family in Senegalia in the March of Ancona in modern-day Italy, and that's a small town on the Adriatic coast, about 85 miles, 140-ish kilometers due east of Florence, but even to this day, you can't get directly there due east because of the mountains, so it it was really, he was born into a, a somewhat isolated location. He was educated at Volterra, Viterbo, and Rome. Definitely not a high-flying bureaucratic type of student or priest. He was known to have epileptic 
bits before his ordination, but those seem to have stopped and never came back again in his lifetime. And there's a lot of different ideas of why that was, some cynical ones, some not-so-cynical ones, which we may get into later. He was ordained a priest in 1819 during the papacy of Pius VII, and this early uh, 18-teens time was not an easy time to be a pope or a priest. His career was pastoral and not an administrative career. He was the spiritual director of an orphanage, sent on papal missions to uh, Chile in 1823 and didn't get home until 1825. Pius was kind of upset, or Mastai Ferretti in this case, because he thought this was a true missionary journey, as in supporting Catholics socially but it, and helping to convert people, but it turned out to be more of a political mission than anything else. When he got back to Italy and Rome, he took over the hospice of San Michele in Rome for about two years. He was made Bishop of Spoleto in 1827 when he was 36. Pius wanted to resign as bishop over disagreements with Pope Gregory XVI. A lot over these Gregory XVI's refusal to uh, modernize. Gregory XVI translated or did an Episcopal transfer to uh, for Mastai Ferretti as Bishop of Imola in 1832. Then he was made a cardinal in 1840 at 48 years old. Let's talk a little bit about Pius's personality. Who was the real Giovanni Mastai, Maria Mastai Ferretti? He's known as a great pastor and a practical man. Everything says he was affable, amiable, uh, a people person, witty, comfortable with women and men both. And that was not always the case for priests, especially in this time period, to be so easygoing, especially with women. He was good looking, photogenic. In his older picture, he looks like a, a classical Italian grandfather figure. People thought he was witty, amiable, funny, but not necessarily clever. And I'm not saying that to say he was stupid or dim-witted, but he was not an intellectual. He didn't have that cutting intellect that so many other people did. He wasn't ever mentioned as being a great theologian or very even very interested in such things. But hey, I mean, not everyone is. Pius was a pastor and a people person. That's that's a different skill set than an administrator or a theologian, an uh, academic type. Uh, an important thing to mention at this time and in this particular place, he was not known to be particularly anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish. He didn't have a lot of positions, at least on the record at that point. But this is going to be a thread that also keeps weaving through uh, the rest of this series. He did snuff, and his cassock was often dirty from the snuff. He really had, uh, he was portrayed, and he put a front up. I mean, that's probably not the right word, a front, but he was, by all means and standards, he was an average guy. Now let's talk a little bit about the political pious. He was thought by many, including Gregory XVI, to be a liberal. Gregory, that great conservative, thought Pius was a, quote, an extreme liberal. In reality, he was not a hardcore leftist revolutionary by any means. Uh, maybe he had moderate liberal leanings. He had some support for Italian nationalism and constitutionalism. Pius sometimes did speak about ending Austrian control in the Italian peninsula, but that was not a terribly controversial opinion. Pius didn't have any other major opinions on what to replace Austria with either. We just don't want him here. Okay, what next? He didn't think it out like that. And really, he gave some uncontroversial opinions without ever getting into the weeds. Going into the conclave of 1846, Mastai Ferretti was known as a good pastor with moderate to liberal leanings. He wasn't a front-runner necessarily, but he was also someone to watch out for. Let's go into this conclave of 1846. It was the, the Roman summer. 
The 15-year-long papacy of Gregory XVI was over, and the question pretty much immediately was, since the second they entombed him the next day, what direction should the church and the papacy move in? Should it become more liberal? Should they continue in a conservative direction, some sort of middle way? What did France and Austria, the two biggest powers who also held a veto power, think? These are all important questions. The conclave process moved really quickly. Gregory the Sixteenth was dead on June 1st. Preparatory meetings started on June 1st. 4th and June 14th, the conclave began. So Gregory was dead, buried, planned a new conclave. Conclave starts all in two weeks. Now, there's some important facts for cardinals who were going into the conclave. France and Austria each had the power of veto through one of their cardinals. France leaned to liberal, Austria leaned towards conservative. France wanted more power to the local churches. Austria wanted a weakened Italy with no one to rally around for unification because of their control in northern Italy. So if you have a really strong papal state square in the middle of the peninsula, it's really hard for north and south and center to all come together. A pope who was leaning in the uh, unification camp was a dangerous thing to Austria. There's two big names who walked into this conclave. Luigi Lambruschini, who was very, very conservative, a high-ranking cardinal during Gregory XVI. He was a high-level diplomat and secretary to Gregory XVI. He was, in a way, Gregory's chosen successor, an odds-on favorite to take the tiara. This rarely works out in papal conclaves, though. There were some liberal candidates, too. There were a few choices, including Mastai Ferretti, but the more popular candidate on the liberal side might have been a Cardinal Gizzi. He had strong French support. The French and important parts of the French church were for more national control of the churches and less Roman control. So you kind of see where that puts Gizzi in all of this. Gregory the Sixteenth thought Mestai Ferretti was a huge liberal, but according to Eamon Duffy, Gregory thought that cats were liberal too, so take that as you will. So these cardinals had a really hard decision to make at this point. Austria was aligned against Mestai Ferretti, but their cardinal from Milan, with their veto power, couldn't get to the conclave in time. He very well may have vetoed Mestai Ferretti for his liberal leanings, but he didn't get there. And so that's a major, did they push the conclave really pedal to the metal so that he couldn't get there with his power of veto? That's a good question. But what would have happened if he did get there, the, this cardinal with the power of veto? That's a very interesting question. Steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors. The internal process of a conclave is obscure. Votes are burned, so exact details of voting aren't known. There's a few sources for speculation on the internals of the conclave from fairly contemporary sources and some within a a very few short decades of the happenings. Um, So uh, we're going to use those sources to really help us uh, tease out some of the politics that were going on. On the very first ballot, Lamberschini got 32 votes and Mastai Ferretti 16. Lamberschini got a majority, but not the super majority needed. There's some disagreement from scholars whether this was the actual count of the first ballot, so take it as it may. Some say Lambruschini w- received 15, whereas Mastai Ferretti received 13. The tide began to shift, though. The next round, Mastai Ferretti was up. Some say 42, but that doesn't seem believable. Others say 17. That seems much more likely to me. So we're seeing that the things are starting to slowly shift. If that 17 is to believe, if the 42 is to believe, then it's a massive tidal wave in his favor. Balloting's closed for the 14th. Let's move on to the next day, the 15th. There's a back and forth between Lambruschini and Mastai Ferretti. Mastai Ferretti gaining momentum. The AM vote, Lambruschini, 15 
Mastai Ferretti, 13. But then we look to the afternoon vote. Lamborghini, 13. Mastai Ferretti, 17. Move on to July 16th. This is where Mastai Ferretti is firmly becoming in control. Morning vote, Lamborghini, 11. Mastai Ferretti, 27. Afternoon vote, Lamborghini, 10. Mastai Ferretti, 36. We have a Pope here because at 36, Mastai Ferretti has reached the super majority required and he has been elected Pope. Two days, four ballots, Giovanni Mastai Ferretti was elected Pope of the Catholic Church. Really, this is a really quick conclave, especially for this day and age. We can speculate about some of the horse trading, but it's only speculation. But let's speculate. Clearly, the liberals were ascendant. If the numbers are to be believed, Lamberschini controlled his conservative faction, but the liberals were split. The horse trading between day one and day two must have been between the liberals just to get their person in. They circled the wagons and elected a popular safe candidate. They didn't go with an extremist. They went for a moderately leaning liberal. Mestai Ferretti was not a firebrand, but he was also not a friend of the conservatives. But this is going to become quite ironic soon. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Pope Pius IX, officially Pope upon his election in June 16th, 1846, is what we're going to call him now. Pius IX, Mestai Ferretti was coronated on June 21st, 1846, on my birthday, as it were. Right off the right off the bat, Pius the Ninth was a huge hit. Almost think of him as a Barack Obama or a Francis the First Pope. He was treated like a rock star everywhere he went. Affable guy, pretty young at fifty five, looked healthy. He had great people skills. He's witty. He's photogenic, and that's important because photography is increasingly becoming less and less expensive form of media at that time. Photography and printing technology allowed regular people to have a picture of Pope Pius IX in their homes. That made people feel more connected to Pius. Right right away, Pius IX organized a large amount of practical reforms. He supported hospitals and schools. He was not necessarily against reforms and modernization either. He started a program to build gas lighting around the papal states. He built railroads. A little late to the game, but never too late, he lowered tariffs, which helped stimulate economic growth. He allowed for a free-ish press, not quite free, but much better than had been there before. And at least initially, he didn't do anything to persecute or in any way put more burdens on the Jewish community. He even ended some of the practices of former popes against the Jews. It was definitely considered, at least at the time, to be a major modernization to, at the very least, if he wasn't promoting civil rights of the Jews. He wasn't being terrible to them either, but don't get comfortable with that policy because that's going to change. Pius IX made some early concessions to the liberals and the moderates. He set up a council of advisors, including a council of laymen. He set up other councils and boards. Now, I personally, from personal experience, dislike governmental boards, uh, having served on a few, but I get the general drift of establishing some sort of democratic-style institutions. He gave amnesty to political prisoners from Gregory XVI's day, and many radicals were released. The more Pius IX conceded, though, the more the liberals and the radicals pushed for even more, and they pushed harder and harder with each concession. Most liberals wanted the Pope and the Church completely out of civil government. The radicals definitely wanted the Church out 100%. Some liberals and moderates would have supported some sort of republic with the Pope as a figurehead. None that that was not an extremely popular position, but it had some support. Liberals wanted less centralized religious power in the Pope and in Rome as well. So you have these these groups that 
Pius the Ninth is at least on paper supposed to be supporting, who are really trying to push in on his power. Will he give in? Is the question. The conservatives, they wanted status quo or even more church power over secular affairs in the papal states. And they definitely wanted more religious power and centralized control in the Pope over these religious issues. So now you can pretty much see where these lines are being drawn. What was the catalyst for major change, though? And the catalyst for major change was to happen in 1848. The revolutions of 1848 completely changed everything for the papacy of Pope Pius IX. Let's quickly run down what the revolutions of 1848 were. We will uh, talk about the effects of the revolution of 1848 in Italy and on the papacy of Pius IX in a future episode. The major, major impact is that nothing would ever be the same afterwards for the papacy. We'll get into specifics, but everything changed. The moderate liberal of Pope Pius IX will very much change his tune only a few months, basically, into his papacy. And that's a good place, I think, to start the beginning of the end of the first part of Pope Pius IX's papacy. So here's the revolutions of 1848 in a nutshell. I plan on giving a very, very, very short history of the revolutions of 1848. There's many great sources to dig into the nitty gritty if you're interested. As far as the revolutions of 1848 in Italy, I will speak with a very special guest, Marco Capelli of the Storia di Italia podcast. We're going to get Italian history from an Italian historian who does an Italian history podcast in Italian. But back to the Revolutions of 1848 overview, the the plural is the key to this. They were revolutions. Countries all over Europe had some level of disturbance. France, Austria, Hungary, Denmark, the Italian states not yet unified, the German states not yet unified, Poland, and Eastern European countries of various stripes. The United Kingdom was mostly unaffected. Russia was not affected at all and actually helped to crush some of these revolutions. Over in the Americas, nothing really happened in the United States. And there was kind of a mixed feelings on this in the United States on these revolutions. Canada, Colombia, and Brazil, people there were able to expand rights and freedoms from their imperial home country's governments in this time. But just hold off. I'll speak a bit to the U.S. and the revolution of 1848 in just a minute. So let's take a look at why these revolutions broke out more or less all at once in 1848. The first outbreak happened in Sicily in January of 1848 and really cascaded from there. If you listen to any of the episodes in this series, we focused on the popes and the church, but times were hard for people in all social strata during the 18th and the 19th centuries, especially the poor in the countries and in the cities. There was war, famine, conscription, and etc. All this stuff really set a bad mood amongst the people. It really takes more than just one factor for open revolt to break out all over a content. But it seems once the ball got rolling, it really spread. That up. Think of the Arab Spring a few years back. Why did that all blow up all over the Arab world almost at once? It's really complicated. Now, people much, much smarter than me don't have completely satisfying answers either. Clearly, more than one thing caused these massive revolts, though. The revolutions of 1848, the Arab Spring, color revolutions, all sorts of other revolutions and mass uprisings and social change. And we can say this for the revolution of 1848. But let's talk about at least a few things that may have got this whole idea rolling. One thing was subsistence farming was fading away into large-scale cash crops. This drove many rural farmers to the cities, but there really wasn't a ton of work for, for them there. This caused societal destabilization. People accustomed to living in the small villages and towns with all that social structure and social network 
were just thrown into cities without any support network whatsoever. Next, we move into industrialization. That really hurt the urban and rural craftsmen who were working in cottage industries, again, upsetting their whole lifestyles. Back on to agriculture and this rise of large-scale cash crops was the rise of monoculture, which is raising one cash crop in a field. Subsistence farmers, they grew vegetables, grains, they had fruit trees, they had animals, all sorts of different, different types of fruits and vegetables and grains, not just one particular type. During this time, more and more monocrops were being grown, the one varietal of one crop. Potatoes in Ireland are an example. It was just one varietal of potato. The uh, corn or maize is another example of one type of crop being grown. Corn had many different varietals. The same thing with potato. Small subsistence farmers in Europe grew different varieties of grain and produce as well. Monoculture crops are great because they're cheaper because of their scale. A lot can be grown one of one type of seed and using one type of methodology, but they're susceptible, really susceptible to failures, diseases, blights, bad weather. And when one crop gets wiped out, the famines are total because there's nothing else to eat. If you were growing one field of potatoes and they all get wiped out by a blight, well, you might be hungry that winter, but you still can rely on the other crops that you've grown. Not the case, though, if you're growing monoculture. Let's look at some of the local effects of the revolutions. Firstly, the violence of these revolutions were focused primarily in the cities. For the most part, participants really wanted to end serfdom where applicable. They wanted constitutions forms formed. They wanted other rights and protections from often despotic governments. They basically wanted more enlightenment. Some wanted much, much more extreme reforms, of course. It wouldn't be a revolution otherwise. In France and Paris, mobs kicked out the king and the prime minister. Socialists took over for a time. The French Revolution of 1848 arguably was the most successful of them all. It resulted in universal male suffrage and many social reforms. Italy, we're going to punt on just for today because Marco is going to really fill us in on that. But in short, it led to more, led Italy down the road to more. Italian unification. Germany as well, it, the revolutions of 1848 really helped push German national unification. In Austria, there was a really big revolt. One of the big effects of it was nationalist identity be, uh, amongst the constituent parts of the Austrian Hungary, Hungarian Empire started to bloom. The Slavs, Germans, Italians, Hungarians, they all wanted their own slice of the pie. One thing that was com got completely pushed out was Austrian unification with the greater Germany. Unification with Germany was out and disunification amongst the Austrian-Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian Empire was definitely in. Everyone had gripes from the aristocracy to the peasantry, sometimes overlapping gripes, oftentimes not. The famous Prime Minister Metternich was forced out. In the end, the riots and revolutions, though, in Austro-Hungary were completely crushed. And really, one of the few reforms that came out of this was that serfdom was ended. Eastern Europe, things were pretty much similar to the other places. Most of these revolutions were completely crushed, though, by the Russian Empire. There were a few moderate gains in rights for various groups, but really not a ton. So really, despite the enormous social upheaval, for the most part, not much changed from the status quo in practical terms. 
Some seeds were planted for later revolutionary change in the way things were done. We see the rise of socialism and Marxism and these different, this rise in these seeds planted in socialism and Marxism would definitely bear fruit in later decades. For the popes and the Catholic Church, revolutions in Austria, France, and Italy were the most important ones. It really threw the pope and the church for a loop. Now, going over to the United States during the Revolution of 1848, it's interesting because the U.S. always had good feelings towards revolutions. You know, the whole American Revolution. Hey, our revolution worked. Why not others? That was at least the sentiment of some. Our system's great, so why not go ahead and have other people copy it? European monarchy and despotism were bad from an American perspective. Take those things down, build up something new. Many countries wound up adopting and adapting certain parts of the U.S. constitutional system to their government. The U.S. of the 1840s was growing, and it... It really didn't see the upheavals that Europe did. Many people had fled the war, panic, famine, economic troubles of Europe to come to the Americas, the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and parts of South America. At this time in the 1840s, we see a huge influx of Germans leaving the German states and Bohemia because of war, conscription, famine, and the lack of economic opportunities. We also see a huge influx of Irish fleeing the famine, repression, and persecution by the British. Keep in mind, Ireland's population still hasn't recovered from the mass exodus during the potato famine. To this day in 2020, the population of Ireland is smaller than it was in the 1840s. The U.S. was in fairly good shape in the 1840s. In 1848, the U.S. won the Mexican-American War. Many of the top generals of the Civil War cut their teeth in the Mexican-American War. This Mexican-American War resulted in a huge gain of territory. Slavery and sectional issues were there, but under the surface, they didn't they weren't bubbling above the surface yet. The issue of slavery and other conflict points would really bloom during the 1850s though. I talked more, a bit more about U.S. history in this episode than I normally would, and the reason for that is we will have an episode or two on the rise of the Catholic Church in the United States. Also, We'll have an episode or two on the thoughts of Pius IX on the U.S. Civil War. He wrote and thought quite a bit about that conflict. It's a fascinating topic that I kind of just stumbled into, but I, I want to really share it because I find it so fascinating. The history of the Catholic Church in the United States is really interested, but complicated as well. But for today, we're going to leave the newly elected Pope Pius IX riding high. He's brought in some modernizations and reforms to the Papal States. Pio Nono, as he was called, popularly called, was beloved by the people for the most part. Factions inside of Italy were still there, but the situation was calm. The Austrians and French and other powers were sort of in balance. The balance of of religious power was leaning in the Pope's direction at this point. There's some push and pull from groups to devolve more power to the national churches, but the ultramontane position was gaining more and more support. At the end of each of these statements about the situation of the Pope on the brink of the revolutions of 1848 should really be at the moment, because everything would change for the papacy and for Pius IX very quickly once these revolutions get started. And that is what we are going to explore next time. So I hope you enjoyed and I will talk to you then.